This is the I Love Success Podcast. I'm Peter Jurukowski, and I have made a vow to myself to help as many people as possible to achieve their dreams. Let's get started. Hey guys, and welcome to the I Love Success Podcast. If you're new to the show, welcome. We're so happy to he- have you here. Um, I was a young, bullied, fat kid who learned martial arts from my father. I got some confidence, I went out, competed, and I, I had some success, and it helped grow my life. And, you know, uh, being able to go after what I want. So martial arts have helped me tremendously, but also having the right people in my corner, coaches, you know, family, friends, even haters, you know, all of that has helped me so much in my life to create what I once dreamt of. And, and this is what I'm doing this. I want you, if you're here today, to, to learn from, uh, from these amazing people that I bring to this, this show and they share so open-heartedly what they have learned in their life, their struggles, their successes, and the journey of you know going after the things that you really, really want. So put it simply, you're here to learn, you're here to have fun. If I were you, I would bring out a notebook and start taking notes because this is going to be a very, very interesting ride. And the serendipity of life sometimes connects you with other human beings that you you were supposed to be connected with. And I, I truly feel like today's guest is one of those people. I was sitting at Ferrarini Cafe having lunch with my wife in Beverly Hills. We came from a hike. We just had a really nice day off and we were in a good mood. And and, and, and there he was uh, with his wife, uh, Steve. And we started talking, we started chatting and uh, we, we, we couldn't leave because Steve has a lot of things to you know, share about life. He's been a great businessman. He's an author, he helps people. I mean, I could go on and on all day, but I'm just gonna end with, with, with saying, saying or reading one thing that I really, really enjoy about Steve. And here it comes. Some people collect stamps, memorabilia, music, dolls, Zippo lighters. I know I used to collect Zippo lighters, uh, bottle caps, stamps. I've collected those as well. Happy meal toys, rocks, bad habits. Manning collects people and stories. And with that said, let's welcome Steve Manning to the I Love Success podcast. Hi, guys. Hi, Peter. Pleasure meeting you. The pleasure is mine. Before you put me on the hot seat and grill me, which I absolutely am looking forward to, this is something I need to say about you and particularly to your audience. Uh, There are a couple of things that are always on my little teleprompter, you know? It's how I've been living my life since I was a kid. I get the kid part being persecuted. I shed blood for what I am, but one, uh, life is not a dress rehearsal. <laughs> We're doing this now. We may never do this again. Two, and that takes me to you. I hold that life without a passion is not a, not a life worth living. So I preach. I raised my kids that way. I mentored everyone who would care to listen to me. When you and I met at Ferrari, and I talked too much for an hour, uh, and you guys left, as you walked, walked away, my wife and I got in the car and I said, you know, uh, I really like that guy. He says, yeah, nice guy, smart guy, lovely wife, lovely couple. And I said, that, that is true. But the thing that struck me, and I will tell you this uh, from me to you, is you in that little conversation exhibit a degree of passion it's hard to find. Very few people are passionate about, oh, hell, anything. They're in a the flow. And you have three options, lead, follow, or get out. And I'm delighted to talk to you because you made that imp- you made an impression. Me. Here is a really passionate dude, and he is a leader. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. I appreciate those compliments. It, it warms uh, a young man reaching soon his old man heart. (laughs) 
So don't hurry with that one. Don't hurry with that. No, you're right. I mean, I just want to want to start by by asking you, like, what was your first passion in life? Do you remember that? I clearly remember my first passion. My first passion was playing tennis. Uh, for reasons of her own, my mother insisted I needed to play tennis. So at four years old, she dragged me at six in the morning to the tennis court. I hated it. Uh, by the time I was 10, I was nationally ranked. And I, it's a passion I had my own. That was my very first passion. I will tell you that my second passion was probably music. Yeah. Uh, I grew up on classical music to begin with. And then I transitioned to the obvious, which is jazz, uh, African rhythms, R&B. And I will share with you that we, my little musical family, my wife and I, and I have two grown daughters. One of them has two daughters who are following in her footsteps. We, we own probably 130,000 cuts of music. Now, of which I have listened to that many. <laughs> but... And how do you own that? Well, people trade stuff, you know. Here's a jumbo drive of 50,000 pieces of music. Eh, you know, that's a, that's a real passion. The next passion to me, quite quite real, is people. Uh, I, I'm cynical. I say, hey, but for people, life would be so simple. But for people, business would be a snap. But how the hell boring could that be? People, people for me are a passion. And, and then... I have my minor passions. Hell, I can bring the same passion to my breakfast that I bring to something I read about. Something's happening in a, in a remote area in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, people like you, I mean, are really by nature inquisitive. We kind of want to know who the hell cares about all that stuff. Well, you know what? If I know enough about it, I care. And then, last but not least, I have developed by nature and by necessity, the passion for doing good homework. There's no substitute for homework. I haven't found it yet. I need to know as much as I possibly can about anything that I get into, which means you read, and more importantly, you talk to people like Peter at a coffee shop on the street, because I can learn from you with every conversation. I can learn from a young man who parked your car. I can learn from two Nobel Prize winners I know, not dropping names because I don't like them. I happen to have met them. Uh, but th those are passions. It's, it's, you gotta, hey, you got to wake up in the morning and say, failure is not an option. The world is my oyster. Thank you, John Lennon. And then you go from there. I, I hope I answered your question. I love it. And uh, do you mind, we should not talk about age, but do you mind if I ask how old you are? I will give you a um, wise ass answer. I'm old enough to hope that I have achieved some degree of two things, some degree of wisdom. I hope I've attained the wisdom of my age. That's one of the problems we have. You, I have a strong sense, don't have the wisdom of your age. You have the wisdom of an older soul. It's what you do is how you're doing it. Two, I'm old enough to not tell you that, but I am seven. I am seventy-two. Seventy-two, and you're still curious about life. That that that's something that I love, uh, because I meet a lot of people. Like I'm big into dreams. I want to help ten million people to achieve their dreams. And a lot of times, I meet people that they go on a path that somebody else wants them to walk, or they get caught up with all the bullshit and negativity and uh, to do's in life that they forget the curiosity and uh, bringing, bringing that joy to life. Do you have any advice to people that are like, they used to be so curious and then kind of life happened to them? Uh, what, what can they do in order to, to, to find that love and passion for curiosity? Two things. One, Relating to you, uh, you will never lose your curiosity because by nature you're that way. You may use your, you may lose your day-to-day -day passion, and because life is freaking interfering all the time. Uh, 
think about it this way. The, 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 world, the world is kind of small, but the opportunity to learn is just endless. You can learn from anybody about anything, anytime. Uh, one of the pieces of advice I give young people is recognize greatness, whatever the hell you see it, and whatever the hell it is. And it's kind of like if you and I are walking down the street in Milwaukee or in Zimbabwe, whatever, you say, I mean, you see that guy over there? He's the best shoe shine guy in a country. You and I are going there, plopping down, not $5. I'll give the guy $35 and sit and talk to him for a while because you're in the presence of greatness. Uh, I, I tell everyone, if somebody's willing to talk to you, ask questions. And how many questions? Oh, until they tell you to just go away. <laughs> because one of, the, one, of the teach, one of the things I teach, and I've had the privilege, it's not a job, it's a privilege, to lead big companies. I've had the privilege to work in, in, in advisory capacity and, and, and as a problem solver, as conflict resolution, big companies. All of those are smarter people than me. And I say, there's no final answer to anything that we get into because the likelihood of you, or certainly me, having a really original thought is limited. So it's deductive. Peter said something. Ooh, that's interesting. If that's true, what else? And you ask the next question, next and next and next. You never stop asking. Every answer you get is nothing more than a testable hypothesis. If that's true, what else? And when you get up in the morning, you have to figure out a way to say failure is not an option. If I fail at what I'm doing, the reason is there's something fundamentally wrong with it. It's not what I've done. I've done everything I know how to do. And yeah, you know, it is an arrogant statement to say that some people, you, me, hell, I picked up the phone one morning at four o'clock and I called the Vatican and I asked for the Pope. I had a question. Now, why did I do that? Because it was arrogant the night before. And I said to these three people, hell, I don't call anybody three times without getting a call back. I won't even call the Pope. So I woke up in the morning really embarrassed. I called the Vatican. Guess what? You get to talk to the Pope on a good day and ask a question. And I get to say, Holy Father, <laughs> you know, I didn't expect to talk to you, so I'm a little disjointed here, but I got this, I got this thought. What do you think? And I had a guy who talked to me for 10 minutes. It's astounding. But giving up is just saying, yeah, it's okay to fail. Look around you and pick up the phone. Call Peter. Peter, I'm in the phone. It ain't happening. What do you think? Peter will give you some advice. You see a guy, you, a woman, you, that, per, okay, approach him. And it's hard to explain to people when you have that motivation where, hell, you find someone and tell them, I'm getting on the red eye to have breakfast with you. I know you're going to teach me this. I know that you will. And people love to hear themselves talk. And most people really like to help. Most do. Just seek them out. I agree with you. And that's what like, I've done 200 and something episodes now or 267 or 270 or something like that. So I've, I've had the honor of talking to so much people and learning. And But what I recall when I started the podcast, my biggest fear was that people would say, no, that they would say, I don't want to talk to you. I don't have time to share. I don't want to share. And, but I, it was a complete limiting belief. And I said, I'm just going to try. I'm going to go after and ask the people that I want to talk to if they want to share. And it's astonishing. If, I, if, you have, if the delivery is done in the right way, almost anybody that has been successful and gone through trials and tribulation will share because All they, of us. they want to help because they needed help at one point. So one thing that I... I I'm curious about in my experience from, from meeting all these people, people that are extraordinary and have this curiosity has a lot of time gone through a lot of trials, a lot of pain in order to develop themselves as extraordinary human beings. What's your story of becoming this 
man that wants to give back, wants to share and, and wants to do something cool? Well, first, uh, uh, characterizing me as extraordinary is way too flattering. Uh, I, th I, 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 I think I'm ordinary. I'm just willing to do more than most. You know, I'm not a young guy, but do doing all-nighters, it's okay. I grew up in a schizophrenic environment. I grew up in communist Romania. My father was a world-class scientist. Uh, his job was to feed 20 million people. At the same time, he was an, he was a, an engineer, agriculture husbandry. At the same time, he was an outspoken critic of the communist government. In those days, they shot you for that in the morning. But if you're feeding 20 million people, they're just going to torture you twice a year after death. They're going to kill you because they need you. So I grew up with understanding the world according to him um, in closed doors, closed windows, and the outside world. What I, got, what I got beat up and bloodied because of my father as a child and because of my religion and all that, that teaches you, that, that, that teach you, teaches you a couple of things, perseverance and some more perseverance. Uh, at 15, we escaped from this country. We literally escaped. I have the dubious distinction of having been homeless on two continents. But when you're a kid, when you're a teenage boy, being homeless in Rome is a bit of an adventure. It's not an adventure when you don't have a dollar in your pocket. When you sneak onto buses, where nice old ladies buy you lunch, where you sneak into every opera and you figure out how to do that. You become resourceful. How do you sneak into every opera in Rome? Well, one day I will tell you, you know, you, you get there. And then my parents were remarkable people. I write a lot about my, my father and my mother in the book that you have. But very early on in my teens, it was kind of like, oh, Steve will figure it out. I'm raised by two loving people who didn't ask me how I was paying college tuition. Steve will figure it out. Well, you don't have much of a choice. You got to eat. <laughs> you got to do that. So you figure it out. So you hustle people on tennis courts, which is a ripoff, which I did. Uh, one of my best and worst jobs, Peter. I cleaned rat cages at the laboratories at Cedars. Now, why is that a good job? Why is it a bad job? Well, you, first you go there and you go down the elevator, four floors, it's everything shiny and beautiful and clean. And you go through the big double doors and you go through the second set of double doors and then you throw up. And then you throw up all day long. Now, it's a bad job because throwing up is not a good thing. However, uh, you say 25 cents an hour more than anywhere else is a good thing. You learn humility. And you learn the concept that work, honest work, is just that. Uh, I don't have to, but I would drive Uber tomorrow. Why not? Honest work. It's not going to affect my ego at all. So you grow up, you, you take a beating, and if you walk away from saying boo-hoo, I remember the day some guy walked up to me and punched me in the nose, broke my nose. I went home crying. I'm a big boy. I'm a big boy. When I'm crying, my father looked at me and said, why are you crying? And I said, okay, so what are you going to do about it? I'm going to take you to the hospital. He said, well, right after I take you to the what are you going to do about it? So I went marching back, found this guy. And when he wasn't looking, I clocked him in the head. That's what I did about it. But there's a life lesson there for my father. He says, okay, this will happen to you, whether physically or intellectually, emotionally. It will happen to you. Uh, you know, I, I, I hope I give you, you know, stories in context to your question. It, it, look. Uh, Steve, let's talk I, about your mom and dad. I want to honor them because it sounds like they, they went through a lot. What, what are the top lessons they learned you in life? My mother 
was a survivor of the of the of the camps in Auschwitz. Uh, people like her, first of all, the people who survived the camps are the most resilient of the people that went to the camps. The biggest lesson from my mother, other than humility and class, uh, uh, you have class because you want to lead a, a classy life. Hopefully you learn it at your parents' need. My mother was a woman that she was very, the room really reserved, she was elegant. I've never heard my mother raise her voice, but my mother had the quickest forehand and backhand you've ever seen. <laughs> never raised her voice, bang. And just so I didn't get whiplash, she hit me with a nice backhand to straighten <laughs> my head. And when I played tennis for a living, I used to be known as that big badass backhand. I got that from my mother. <laughs> but I think that the whole concept of class, which I wrote a piece about in that book you have, and I lectured on it in context of being a substantial individual, that came from my mother and her insistence that there are some things we do and some things we don't do. Yeah. That sounds like an arrogant concept. I used to say, well, why are we better than they are? No, we're not. This is just the way we live. My father, uh, my father was an immense human being. Again, there are a number of stories in the book. I hope that you've read them or you will read them. My father- We're gonna talk a, a lot more about your book. Sorry to interrupt you because um, it's, a, it's a very interesting book and that's why we are here today. That's how we got connected. Um, my father, may be the only human being I have ever met. You asked me what I learned, what the big lesson in life is. Maybe the only human being I have ever met who lived and suffered for his morality. He is the only human being I've ever met that was never morally ambiguous and finally never situationally ethical. My father was tortured for his beliefs tortured for who believed and, and spoke of. I grew up with that man. And in this world today, that's impossible. You gotta bend. You gotta bend a little. The time, circumstances, needs, whatever. That man didn't bend. And the biggest lesson from a man like that, and I will share this with you very briefly, is the last 10 years of that man's life were horrible, it was dying. Uh, my father is one of those unique people that escaped the German labor camp. I mean, there, there are some, but a handful. Uh, the last 10 years of his life were awful. The man died. He was sick. All that bad life. And he was lonely. It was us and a few people. And then the man passed away. And the, the people at the cemetery asked, uh, well, which chapel do you want? And I said, the one that holds 100 people, who's going to show up? We are people that work for me, people who work for my sister, and my mother's half a dozen friends. Who else is going to show up? This man has been dying for 10 years. And when we got there, and we're sitting behind a curtain, you know, the funeral guy, I get to grab a funeral guy. Dude, we're late at a funeral with a couple of people. He says, it's not that, Steve, is." We need a little more time to put out the chairs. What chairs? Uh, well, you know, there's a kind of a crowd out here. And I looked out and there were 600 people out there. And I said, holy, holy, who the hell are all these old people? And, you know, what's interesting about that is that I'm Jewish. We Jews bury our dead in the heartbeat. We just want them gone. Steve died, he's gone tomorrow. You know, and, and then we that will eat and celebrate, right? <laughs> and I said, the man died two days ago, and there's hundreds of people, all these old people. And I said, whoa, who the hell are these people? And when it was all done, I'm standing there shaking hands. And I shake hands with four or 500 people who all say the same thing. I heard your father died. I had to come. I had to come. I have to go to your house and talk to you about your father. I spent the next week listening to all these old people. Where they come from? Australia, guy from New Zealand, uh, Belgium, 
uh, South America, Europe, all over the place. And they all had stories to tell about that big man. And why? Because he was truly that righteous and he really lived that way. That would be the biggest lesson of my life. Uh, to, to, to try to figure out how he did that, we paid the price. And yes. I occasionally, I have paid a price for being somewhat that way as well. You know, I promise you, if I didn't like you, if you didn't hit me, and you did, you got to me, I would say, no, thanks. But I want to talk to you because I learned from you. So the lesson is, uh, it sounds like your father was, it was so important for him to speak his truth. And that 100% was 100% of the time. Yeah. And that takes courage. Um, it's it's so interesting. It's um, I get I I meet a lot of people. I talk to a lot of people, and I I want to always speak my truth, but I'm also scared of hurting people. You know, so that's that's what makes me sometimes not speaking my truth and, and avoiding you know the. The, the real subject, but I do respect and I love people that have the tenacity and the courage to speak their truth in all situations. You, you know, Peter, there's, there's a big chasm between holding back and being gratuitous. Yeah. You know, uh, you may think I'm a really ugly guy, but telling me that you're taking a pound of flesh. On the other hand, if my fly is open and you don't tell me, that's wrong. Yeah. On the other hand, if I open myself up to you and tell you, Peter, I'd love to know what you think. Yeah. Then I think you owe to yourself and to me to be absolutely honest without being brutally honest. A smart people like you who have, you, you have the gab, you have the gift, uh, you're erudite. Man, you can lay down some hurt with two sentences. <laughs> There's a difference, you know, between doing that and, and being helpful. I absolutely ask for criticism yeah. from people I respect, from people that, that clearly have better knowledge than I do, which is about 99% of the population. Yeah. You know, I, I, I promise you, I've logged more air miles than you believe just to listen to people. I just think they're just, Wow. And they're wow and stuff that doesn't mean anything to me, but they're wow. They're wow. I don't know how they think. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about traveling. How many countries have you been to? Uh, I have seen much of Latin America and South America. And I've seen pretty much all of Europe. Um, I ventured, my skis took me to Pakistan one day which scared the hell out of me, by the way, uh, you know, and I wrote a piece about that. Said, What's the most dangerous place on earth? Pakistan. Is it? Really? <laughs> Man, there's a lot of Pakistanis. I'm not going to ask you religion, but likely they don't like you. I know they don't like me. And they have a bunch of nuclear weapons. <laughs> and they're pointed in, a, in oddball directions. Pakistan is a scary place as far as I'm concerned in the world, followed by some others with, that you and I know, and we can talk about endlessly. I just wrote a piece on, on China, uh, and the uh, answer I got from my really smart friends is you're a provocateur. No, I was quoting Not other at people. All, Steve. Let, 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 us, let us share what the, the name of your book is. If you don't know Steve, it, his new book is called Pimps, Whores, and patrons of virtue. So that's, that's, that feels very provocative. So just, just share, how, how did you pick that name? Uh, many years ago, uh, a woman who had kids older than me, she was an agent for us. She's a, a broker, a media broker for us. I wonder, and she were a friend, I said to her, how the hell could you work with those people, a client? They are corrupt. They are awful. God will strike you then. And she said to me, uh, my name was Claire, coincidentally, as my mother's Claire, said, me, you know, you know, Bobby, we are all pimps and whores. I do it because I make a lot of money. And I said to her, well, you may be a whore or a pimp. I'm not. And then 
as I progress through life, I say, you know, we all tend to put people in buckets. You know, I said, well, there are pimps in our lives, without a doubt. And there are a lot of whores in our lives. And a whore is pejorative, without a doubt, but it's not intended that way. It's really a character trait, you know. And then there are other people who want to be virtuous, and some are, and some are patrons who try to be virtuous. What does that mean, virtuous? For what? What is that? Because I, I am a, an immigrant, so to speak. So I, I don't understand the whole concept of. So, being virtuous. so, so am I. <laughs> uh, I think you virtuous means you lead a life. I have never defined it, by the way. Yeah. I think it's to you. I think it's leading a righteous life, not at the direct expense of others. That doesn't That's mean you don't do, you don't do you, you do your job, get paid. You know, but it's a leading a life, a, 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 a righteous life, a good life, a solid life, not a corrupt life, and leading that and not at the expense of anybody else. I think that's living virtuously. Like uh, that. You know, providing you, value and being a servant and looking for the best. You and I are not going to steal candy from a kid, and we're not going to rob a 7 Eleven. Uh, we will find an elegant solution to being hungry. Uh, that's virtuous. And you know, it's not uh, being virtuous as success. I have my definition of success as well. Is not defined in what you are. It's defined in who you are. Okay. Uh, I, I have a, a piece in a book. It's called On Class. Uh, it is it's a skating a letter I wrote to a guy who runs one of the big department store chains that you and I have gone to. Because if you live in America, you've been there. Yeah. Anyway, I said to him that next time you come to LA, we're going downtown. Uh, Pershing Square, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a square on top of the parking lots of the music center. It's got vents and grates. There are a lot of homeless people there. Why? Because they sleep on the grates. And I'll find the guy whose name is Ted. He's a homeless guy. He's been homeless forever. I have no idea how Ted became homeless. For all I know, he might have been a nuclear physicist 30 years ago, and his wife cheated on him. I don't know. Or... As a lot of homeless, there's some really fundamental issues that he has never been able to deal with. Nobody helped him out. He wears the same members-only jacket for 20 years. Same clothes, missing teeth. And the reason I wrote to this guy about that, about that man, homeless guy, I said, you and I are going to go find this guy, Ted. He, I know he lives there because when some really smart or inquisitive press I don't mean the ordinary press, the in-depth folks. Want to interview a homeless guy? They find Ted. Because she's erudite. is really well-spoken. It's such a contrast the way you look at the guy and what he says. And then he exhibits what I say is really uniquely, it's really not that often found, which is class. That homeless guy who's eating out of garbage cans, sleeps on great wears the same clothes for 30 years, and God knows what his issues are. That's class. And I said to this man, I looked up his tank case. He only made $8 million last year. Bad year for him. I said, with due respect, he has more class in his left butt cheek than you have. Uh, so uh, I, I've gone a long way, I think, uh, to answer your question about what is virtue? You know, Sometimes somebody is virtuous by, 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 by virtue of something they do. Every once in a while, you and I will run to somebody who I really appreciate, respect what that guy or that woman does. Yeah. I absolutely don't want them at my dinner table. Yeah. Don't like them. But there's some virtue. And I have met people, and you have too. You've interviewed some very interesting people. I have met some people who were incredibly philanthropic, who did all this good. Everyone loved them. They got the awards. They got the TV coverage. 
until they got arrested at five in the morning because they were child pornographers. Now, there are th that's a, that is extreme. When Ivan Bosky went down, the, the dude who had three hundred million dollars doing inside trading, he was a disgusting man. He would go to a restaurant here in Beverly Hills and order every single main course. Hey, he'd say, I have $300 million. I don't have to make a choice. I'll just taste them all. Take a bite, go, take a bite, go, take a bite. And he say, I didn't know him. I knew his number two guy. How? I sat next to him on an airplane for seven hours one day. And I, man, I, I was a Spanish in position. If you if you sit with you for seven hours, your friend. <laughs> My the bottom line to that, and this is this is an odd twist on what I just said. Yeah. I said this guy, that's disgusting. Yeah. Now, well, my friend Kevin and I go restaurant order four, three main courses because we eat like horses, but that's different. Yeah. I said, so you throwing out all this food, all these hungry kids? And I said, wait a minute. He also gives away $30 million a year to really good righteous causes. I'm okay with him throwing out the food. He's a pig, but hey, throw out more food. If that what turns you on and makes you do something that virtuous. So he was a pig who did a lot of good. Okay, throw out the food. That's some kind of virtue. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I, it. When we're talking about, you know, virtue or, or having a character in life, it always brings me back to martial arts. And one of the things, if you're a Japanese martial artist, uh, there's something called Bushido, uh, which means the way of the warrior. And one thing that I've thought about recently since I re read about this is that if you're a Bushi, a warrior, there's no need for promises. If something is said, it's like it's already done. If something is said, it's like it's already done. And I think people forget this today because I hear so much promises. Uh, I'm in the real estate industry. And as you can know, like there's, oh. there's a, we hear a lot of things all the time, but it's air. Like when people talk air, I, I do not understand that because in my world, when I say something, it's like it's already done. Uh, can you just, like, what's your thought on that? And I don't promise this and I'm saying things and not doing it because I think there's a big gap in today's world that creates misery in a lot of relationships because we're, 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 we're saying, we're promising a lot of things but doing a very little. That, that, that Peter, is a really seminal question to behavior. And all of that. I mean, that's like a, if there are four pillars, that's maybe one of them. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, it, fundamentally, you are known by the company you keep. Eventually, that's true. You're also known by your word. Hey, Bob over there is a complete asshole, but if he tells you it's raining, bring an umbrella. Now, so in terms of making promises, I personally, I never make a promise I can't keep. But that is a big statement. Whoa, Steve is a great guy. No, 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 no. God forbid you call me at two in the morning and say, hey, man, uh, I need something. I need something you can do. I will, I need a favor. My answer is always the same, no, no. Favor means that I may or may not do it. And if I do, one day you will call me and say, uh, I'll say, do you remember when you called me? I did that. No, 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 no. I, same thing with my own kids. No, 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 no. Please tell me what you need or want. If I can, I will. If I can't, I won't. If there's a price tag, I will tell you. If you're my kid, that's how we stay friends forever. And I will not, I, mean, I, I was about to say disappointment. I will not disappoint you. I don't use the word disappointment. To me, my character, 
Uh, to me, disappointment is weak person's anger. I don't get disappointed. I just get angry and unhealthy. Now, you, in terms of promises and all of that, I get the sense that you're a man of character, but I also know that you're a man of genuine discipline and goals. I think you learned that at your parents' knees. I think you learned that from your father early on. He pushed you or encouraged you to do something, uh, uh, karate or any of those disciplines. It ain't about the physics. It ain't about the physiology. It's about the discipline. A, a, a hundred pound weakling then beat the living hell out of me because the discipline to execute. So you, you, you look, you know by the company you keep and always consider the source. I can never change the stripes of the zebra. I can just ignore them or say, guess what? We're having zebra steak, not beef steak. So I hope I answered your question. It's the, your question is, is, is complex as all day long. I know, and we're getting deep here. And that's why I love talking to you because we can, we can talk about uh, interesting subjects. Uh, why should people read your book? Well, it's an interesting thing. Uh, the book, as you know, okay, thank you. Uh, the book, as you know, is not a novel. Uh, it Hey, I go through two, three books a week. Now, I don't remember any of them. I may not, if it wasn't for Amazon, I'd be buying the same stuff over and over again. Amazon reminds me, you already have this book. Uh, it's not a novel. What's fascinating is, look, I get a lot of emails because my email address is in the book. And I get a lot of emails, people, and how, how many people, look, I can't go in the sushi bar and not sell three books. Hey, you will buy my book just to get rid of me, you know? But I think that- That's what I did, I, not to get rid of you, but I bought the book- While we're sitting there. On the spot, and because you were- you were proud of it and it comes back to passion. And that's something that I admire with you because I've written several books, but I, I have not reached that level of courage to, to be, to talk about it as much as you did. So, and I, I would, I would, that. I would like to address that in a minute after I answer your question, yeah. because I reject that by the way, <laughs> why not? You're paying for the time. I'm going to reject it. Uh, um, I run into countless people, countless. I run into a lot of people who will tell me, I haven't read a book since college. I don't read books. I read magazine articles. Okay. I read books and magazine articles and two uh, 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 clipping services and three wire services, which is why I'm so damn unhappy half the time with what's happening in the world. But uh, so I said, wait a minute. My book is not a novel. My book is a collection of stories, satire, humor, uh, 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 my musics. And half this book is dead serious. And then the other half is not. And I, everybody I talked to, you know, hopscotch in chapters. I read the first chapter, loved it, Eugene. And then I saw this title, Only Women Bleed? What the hell does that mean? I read that. Okay, so that's four pages. This is three or four, that's two. There are two chapters in this book that are one page and some stories and I relate them. I relate to, to hopefully things people relate to. You know, I've done a lot of public speaking in my lifetime to some audiences that were all smarter than me. Everybody I ever talked to was smarter than me. I mean, you know, the Chicago Business Council doesn't invite a guy like me to talk to them about what I think marketing is gonna look like in the next 20 years. I was the only guy in the room who didn't have a PhD in economics. I was the only guy there wearing a t-shirt and jeans. The women were wearing suits and ties. But uh, I think that you have to, the book relates at some level to everybody. You will read my book. You'll say to me, I, I love this one. I did not get the Chinese ideogram for change. And I'll tell you, I don't get it either. I just wrote it because I was messing with one of my friends who's written 18 books, 200 articles, been on the cover of Forbes seven times, 
And I thought I'd mess with him because I don't understand everything, anything he says. So I wrote this to mess with him. When you read it the third time, you'll say to me, ah, got it. It means nothing. It's nonsense. It's true pounding a keyboard. Looks impressive, don't it? You know, so I did that just to mess with one guy, college professor up in, in Montreal. So uh, the sh- my one of my favorite reviews, I tell you, want to read my book? Please go to Amazon, read my reviews. If you like the reviews, please buy the book. One of the reviews is a guy I, I met, last time I saw him, 25 years ago, maybe. He's a TV producer, movie producer, director, writer, blah, blah. And all the stuff he's done was all this puff shit, you know, really puff stuff. America's favorite videos, you know. And then he wrote a phenomenally scholarly book on DNA structures, how they affect behavior and all that. I took time. I, that book took me two weeks. I get through that book in a night, no two weeks. And then he created a financial instrument for microtransactions across banks. The dude that did American Funniest Videos, he writes a review. I get an email. I have talked to a guy in years. Hey, I read your book. Hey, I'm seven, eight bucks ahead now. And he says, uh, I sold eight books for you last night. Huh? Well, he was on his night flight, an international night flight, sitting in the cabin. And throughout the night, people tapped him on the shoulder. He had his noise canceling cans on. Excuse me, sir. What are you laughing about? Because he was laughing out loud out of his mind, reading some of the stories. He says, I sold eight books for you. So, yeah, uh, I don't attempt to write humor. I sure as hell write satire. Uh, and some, and, and there are very serious stories about serious topics, including uh, things about my parents, for example. My father is a big presence because he was a big man. Uh, and I also write a lot of uh, social, political, economic crap that I don't really want to read myself but I exchange stuff with people that do that. And speaking of people who have what you have, the drive and the focus, and you asked me about focus, about a week ago Sunday, I spent five and a half hours exchanging emails with uh, a guy I knew when I was a kid who has since become a world-class economist. And I ended up writing a piece for him on critical race theory. But... Hey, how you doing? Well, that's a four-page response with a bibliography. It'll take me 10 years to read. But I'm compelled to respond. Yeah. I can't read his books. Just not smart enough. But I can read the reviews of his book. And that will drive me to read the reviews of the next one, the next one, the next one. And if I read everything he sends me, I'll be reading it to 28 hours a day. But I have what it takes. And I think that's something that, speaking of passion, I can't match the man, but I can sure as hell try. So I spent my Sunday bouncing emails back and forth to the guy who I'm pretty sure is writing in English, but I'm not pretty sure I get it. The book, I contend that pe- people pick up the book. What the hell is this? By the way, the new version of the book actually has a subtitle. Hey, it says there are stories in it. You look at the table of contents. I get emails from people. The first thing I did, I read this thing about Isaac Asimov's underwear. What the hell is that? And then I went to this one and that one, that one. My own, my own people. Uh, I, you know, I just, I just acquired a new publicist because I think I need to have one. Uh, she sends me ten emails a day. Uh, I read this. I read that. Tell me about that guy. Who the hell was that guy you wrote about? Come on, fess up. And it's, it's fantastic. Any pick a story, any story. I will talk to you as long as you want to talk to me about it. Because they all mean something very specific to me. And pray and hope they mean something specific. People read it. There's something there for everybody. Uh, yeah, you want to be able to read. <laughs> you know, uh, my, my language is sometimes a little complex. Yeah. Being an immigrant, I learned this language in my teens. Yeah. And I learned it by learning a lot of words. And man, I'm going to use every one of them. I love it. Last, last and final question before I let you go, uh, Steve, is 
we've had a, such a great time here and it, it's just I can talk to you forever, you know, and 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 this can any anytime, forever. anytime I'll be buying the latte. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we need to, we need to bring that back. And uh, my final question is to you and I ask all my guests. We're all about sharing stories, knowledge, the journey, but at the end of the day, my goal here is for people to get closer to their dream. So in your opinion and in your life, what you have learned, what would be the first step for the people listening and watching this show to take in order to get closer to their dreams and goals? Well, I think that there are uh, basically three components to that. First, you have to identify your dream. Most of the people you and I know are just in the flow. What exactly is the point? Now, I can't be critical because most of us have to be in the flow. We have to make a living. We have to eat. We have to have, provide shelter for our families. Hey, listen, in most of the world, providing food and shelter to your family is considered absolute success. Yeah. First, you got to define what the goal is. Uh, but defining the goal is number one, number two, number three, number four. The goal has to be attainable. It shouldn't be right here, low-lying fruit. Does, does anybody can do that? It has to be a stretch, but it has to be realistic. Because if my goal, so once again, dunk a basketball, yeah. dude, that ain't gonna happen. That's years ago. I could dunk a basketball. Today, I look at, I look up at it and say, man, that's up there. <laughs> you have to have a goal, and you have to define it. In, in attainable terms, it should be a reach, shouldn't be no big deal. Then what people miss out is, okay, you got to go, which theoretically is attainable. If you work, okay. How are you going to get there? So a lot of people have this goal and don't, know how to, don't, don't, don't actually do the thinking, don't know how they're going to get there. And there's some people that should get there and they don't even know they're there because they haven't defined the goal yet. So you have to figure this, this is what I have to do to get there. And then you wake up early in the morning and every day and they eat a lot of spinach and put in the hard yards. In my little life, whatever I've attained or hope to attain in my lifetime, I have yet to find a substitute for homework. I, some people have the benefit of, of, of biological happenstance. Uh, you happen to be one of the Rothschild children. And your life is spending money and hopefully doing some good. You have no goals. Your goal is to spend money. I mean, it's not a goal. There's a lifetime goal unless you spend it righteously. You have to be able to get there. If you're not willing to do the work, I guarantee this to 100% certainty. It's the same with inventions. I just created two mobile apps. No one's knocked me off yet. God, I wish they would knock me off so I can sue somebody. But... Uh, if you don't have a goal, not only do the work, never going to happen. Do the work. There's no substitute for even work. You wake up earlier than everybody else. You stay late on everybody else. And you outwork them. Because every single day when you're standing there, taking a shower, putting clothes on, shaving, putting on your stockings, whatever you're doing, thinking about what you, all that you can do, I promise you, there's umpteen people in America thinking the same thing. And among them, there are some that have the means, the opportunity, and the drive to friggin' do it. And then what do you end up being? You end up sitting in the back of the truck. By the time you get around to it, people beat you to it because they had the drive. There's, um, yeah, a set a goal that's attainable, not low-lying fruit. Two, figure out how to get there. What do you need to do? And remember, people are so willing to help. I mean, you can walk into, I have 100% certainly, I know, you can walk into a, a, a financial institution up in Silicon Valley and talk them into financing, picking up dog excrement on parking lots as a business because you, because you have what it takes. But if you're not willing to do the work, I'll do it. Hey, I heard you had a great idea. I'll do it. So I, I, think, that, I, think, I think that's a good answer. It's a great answer. And it sounds like you read the gold book uh, that I wrote. It's exactly the answer. And 
it's the answer I'm keep getting from all these uh, people that are actually doing it. So it works. Uh, Steve Manning, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on, sharing here. It, we had a, such a great time. If you're still here listening, watching this show, go to Amazon, pick up his books, Pimp's Horse and Pat, Patrons of Virtue by S.J. Manning, write a review. Also, I want to help at least 10 million people in 10 years to go after their dreams. So if you enjoy this conversation, please share it with somebody that needs to hear this message. Give me a review on iTunes. <laughs> Check me out on YouTube. Just Google my name. If you can't spell it, Google will help you. I remember, I'm Eastern European. I can spell your name. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, guys. And I'll see you next week.